Good evening, everybody. This is uh, the meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm Pat Hamlin. I'm the vice chair of the uh, board, and I've been designated chair for tonight's meeting. So I'm calling this meeting to order. Uh, it is now 7.32 p.m. Uh, I ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak to please mute their connection until such time as they're recognized by the chair. So to start with, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. We'll start with the members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Christian Klein. Present. Roger DuPont. Here. Daniel Riccardelli. Here. Vanket Holy. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. Adam LeBlanc. Here. And with her town officials, is Colleen Ralston, the administrative assistant of the board here? Here. Thank you, Colleen. Um, outside Council, uh, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Paul. Uh, and the board's peer review consultant, uh, Sean Reardon. Here. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Sean. Uh, appearing for the applicant, I'm only going to go through the council and and to see, and the applicant's leader, uh, Mary Lynn Stanley O'Connor. Are you here? Here. Thank you, Mary. And Erica Schwartz. Here. Uh, Mary, would do you would you like to introduce your team? Sure. I, I'll introduce the people that are going to speak this evening um, to Mr. Reardon's report. I think that makes the most sense. Yes. Uh, well, we have Erica Schwartz, who is the executive director of the Housing Corporation. But tonight uh, we have representatives of Util. Uh, Rachel Ain and Nick Yerens and Jeffrey Pilat from Sammy Otis, who will speak to the site civil uh, matters referenced in Mr. Reardon's report. Great. So that gets to the end of that list. Um, this is an open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. It's being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for a whole bunch of things, which I'm not going to read to you tonight. Uh, this act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting of provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to uh, remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided by us during the public comment period during each public meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others by computer auto, audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care not to share any personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask that you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the meeting's agenda or the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. There's only one matter on our agenda tonight, a continuation of the public hearing on the request for a comprehensive permit uh, at 10 Sunnyside Avenue. So we're now going to turn to that comprehensive uh, hearing. In the past, I've usually begun these sessions by observing that there'll be many other sessions down the road uh, and you'll have lots and lots of time to address the various matters that come up. Now, however, we're approaching the end of the road. 
and tonight will be the last session that's devoted generally to developing the factual record of this case. Uh, next, our, our next meeting, which is scheduled for August 15th, will primarily focus on the language of a draft comprehensive permit, although it may be necessary to resolve a few outstanding issues. Barring unforeseen circumstances, we'll close the public hearing in this case at the end of that meeting. The record will remain open for written comments until the hearing is closed. Once the hearing is closed, the board will begin the del deliberations phase. It cannot receive any new information from the applicant, the town, the public, its consultant, or anyone else. It will, of course, include discuss the deliberations with Mr. Haverty, who, as our legal advisor, is the, the principal draftsman of the board's decision. Legally, the board is required to render a decision within 40 days of the closing of the public hearing. If, in fact, we close on August the 15th, um, our decision will be due no later than Sunday, September 24th. So tonight, we'll be taking up the comments submitted by the board's uh, peer review consultant, Sean Reardon, whom we int introduced himself earlier, uh, primarily on the civil aspects of the proposal. Those comments are in the record, as well as the applicant's submissions responding to them, and a number of updated plans and other documents. I've asked Mr. Reardon to provide an overview and touch on several specific comments that might benefit from discussion tonight. After Mr. Reardon has introduced his comments, Mr. O'Connor will have a chance to present the applicant's response, presumably as sort of the mistress of ceremonies for the team response she described before. Um, and we'll again focus on the matters that are important to discuss uh, at this hearing. And also, on my understanding is that there are a number of other, there's a, a new waiver list that has been provided, and uh, Ms. O'Connor may wish to, to uh, describe that to the board, uh, as well as uh, some additional information that was requested at prior meetings. So following the opening presentations, the board will be the floor will be open to questions and comments by the board. After that, the usual public hearing, uh, followed by board comments again and questions going into the last meeting. Uh, and then I anticipate that we'll continue uh, this hearing to August 15th. And with all that, let me turn to Sean and let you get to the really interesting part of the meeting. The first time I've ever heard it referred to as that, but I'll do my best. Um, so again, my name is Sean Reardon. I'm the board's um, consultant, review consultant on matters related to sort of the technical features of the design and traffic related matters. Um, what we did is we reviewed all the submittals and prepared a, a comment letter addressing, you know, just a, a, not so much areas of concern, but just areas that maybe warrant some further attention um, uh, going forward so that uh, they don't get lost before this project goes to say a building permit or something like that. So um, what we did is we, we listed all our comments and in all of those comments, we felt were addressable um, without compromising the project or creating any fundamental changes in the project. So really they're just items that we would envision being captured as part of future revisions that would happen before building permit submission. So for the purposes of the board's review, we didn't see anything that um, constitute a, a level of concern that would warrant sort of delaying any closure of the, of the, of the public hearing if they chose to do so. Um, but some of the, the, the main points were um, just to go through the in the order that they, they occur on the, the letter. Item number three was probably one of our first significant concerns, and that has to do with a drain line that's um, that the project ties into and relies on for um, discharging its runoff. It, it's a little bit unclear as to where the drain line ends and what it serves and how it gets um, to the public way. Right now, the, the point of connection is a, is a manhole that exists on an adjacent parcel. So we, we just wanted some confirmation um, that that's a public manhole. Um, the applicant provided some record drawings from the, um, the engineering department that showed it's, it's part of the town's drainage infrastructure. So what we're presuming is they have, the town has prescriptive rights for it that, um, you know, if, if there's no formal easement, certainly there's there's rights that are granted just by it being there for so long. Um, one of the things that we did note in the documentation that was submitted was that it does show that drain line extending to provide service to the parcel behind the development parcel. Um, 
and the record information shows the drain going up the adjacent property, but there's the survey drawing for the project doesn't show that pipe. So our concern is there's a pipe that heads towards the project site that we just wanna make sure that in sort of cutting off that pipe that the, the project confirms that it doesn't serve another parcel before they do so. And then if it did, there's really no significant hurdle for diverting the pipe around their building. The, the project has you know, at least five or six feet on either side of the building. So there's more than enough room to divert a drain line if they needed to. Um, going on, uh, what we, and we hit on this at the last hearing was about the um, sort of the lack of, of detail on sort of the construction management methodologies and you know, how they're gonna deal with building such a, 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 a not a large building, but a, a building that comprises most of the site. And I thought the applicants um, developer builder gave a, a really good summary about what they plan to do and how they plan to handle those things. And the project is committed to doing a construction management plan as part of the building permit filing. I thought that was appropriate. And one of the, the, the big distinctions between this site and the prior project that we assisted on on Mass Ave is, you know, this this road is a very very low volume road. So certainly none of the same concerns that we have out at um, at, at Mass Ave. So I, I think the the methodology described by the applicant's representative seemed appropriate, and don't see any reason why that wasn't those the issues that we thought about were aren't solvable. Um, going on, we had some concern about you know, how the walls would be demolished and, and managed given that they retain slopes on the, uh, on the abutting parcels. The construction manager also pointed out that, you know, that's something they'd have to be worked out with the adjacent property owners and that, that seemed appropriate. Um, we, we just, in each case, we just recommended the condition in the board's decision that just, you know, holds the project to, to doing those things before any building permit get, gets issued. Um, you, Emergency vehicles were something we looked at too. Um, again, in this case, a little bit different than 1010 Mass or 1025 Mass Ave. This building's relatively small. It, it doesn't have a big depth dimension to it. Um, and again, low volume street it's on. So it's nothing that we saw that would sort of represent a, a sort of a prohibitive um, condition to, to the fire department adequately accessing the site. Also, both of the all, the property on all three sides it has either parking or open area, so really easy to access from adjacent parcels if they needed to. Um, going on. We talked about um, a concern for, or at least a, a little bit better understanding of how loading and unloading would happen at the site, given that there's really no street side parking um, and no set aside space within the garage for loading or unloading, but um, don't think it's unreasonable that most of that could happen street side. Um, I'm sure that street is, is pretty used to people queuing in it temporarily either to get service at the, the, uh, the prior establishment that was here or the adjacent one. So I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that whatever um, needed to happen short term could happen right along the curb and traffic would just get around it. If it was something longer term, then the applicant we would presume would, would go to the town and, and look for a temporary lane closure or something like that, which again, because of the low volumes on sun, sunny side, it, it, I don't think that would be a problem either. Um, Trying to go through. We talked a, a little bit briefly about the garage door and its placement relative to the street. So we noticed on the plan that the garage door was close to the edge of the layout line or edge of the edge of the property line, which would force that if a car had to stop at the door, it would likely its rear end would likely be in the street. Again, not a not a high uh, risk or a high um, a high sensitivity area because of the the low volumes in the road. And I think in a prior conversation, the applicant was telling us that you know, the door placement was in response to some prior concerns about not creating a sort of an alcove where people could hide. So we, we thought it was appropriate that, you know, that, that they take the measures that they did where the door was closer to the street, thereby preventing 
sort of someone from hiding out in a darker space on such a low volume roadway. Um, we asked for some information about water and sewer demands. The applicant provided some of that. We haven't reviewed it all, but we anticipate it's gonna be fine. Um, there were some minor changes to sewer routing and, and drain routing that we asked, which were I think were cleaned up. Um, and some minor changes to some grading. Oh, and we also we were provided some additional um, stormwater analysis. That was probably the bigger change. In our comment letter, we were struggling a bit with the, the infiltration system that was being proposed underneath the building. Traditionally, infiltration systems aren't sort of accepted underneath buildings. Um, but in this case, we looked back at some of the old historical photos that showed the site was completely paved back in 2019. So we suggested to the applicant that they consider revising their analysis to reflect that and thereby the project would actually result in a net decrease in impervious surface. So the, uh, the need for that whole infiltration infiltration system went away, um, which we're sort of happy to see. And, um, and the, the drawings now reflect that. Um, and I think aside from some minor comments related to sort of references to drawings and some elevations, I, um, we're pretty comfortable with where the plans sit right now and that any outstanding items can certainly be handled in a, in a condition of approval. Great, thank you, Sean. Mr. Connor, this, this is your time to- uh, Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you. First of all, I wanna thank Mr. Reardon for so quickly getting out his a peer review report and for Mr. Reardon and Mr. Hanlins taking the time to review it with the team. And I wanna thank the zoning board for their uh, work on this project. Uh, let me say that uh, you have a number of submissions that Rochelle and uh, Nick and Jeff will go over, but I wanted to uh, review a couple of things. Um, I wanna talk about the issue with respect to the, the sidewalk beyond the project site. This uh, development is 100% affordable and is public funds. There is no extra money for uh, my client to do anything outside the project, the uh, four corners of the project. This is not your typical 40B where we have 15% of the units that are affordable and the rest market rate. So, so that is not a possibility here. Um, the, I wanted to talk too about uh, the, uh, the waiver list. You have a revised waiver list. And that waiver list uh, primarily was revised for two reasons. One, to show that the parking space requirement is one space per unit under the bylaw. Uh, and I had had 1.5 in there from under the old uh, bylaw. The other thing is I did put a waiver request in there um, to waive the requirement for the storm for compliance with the Arlington stormwater bylaw. I put that in there um, I really don't think that it needs to be a waiver because my reading of the Arlington Stormwater Bylaw from April of 2022 is that this project is exempt from it, and I will tell you why. Um, the bylaw requires uh, that a project comply uh, a new development if there's an increase in impervious surface of 350 square feet or more. What is actually happening here is there is an increase substantially in pervious space here. So I do not think that the bylaw, uh, the stormwater bylaw applies here, uh, but we have put that waiver in there just in case. So I, I would turn this over now um, to Rochelle um, to review the submissions. The submissions address what um, uh, Mr. Reardon's uh, comments in the peer review, as well as the board's questions over the past couple of hearings. Rochelle? Thank you, Mary. Um, I was specifically going to address a couple of questions that had come up um, pre prior about shadow study and um, height delta. Shall I start there? Or should we um, continue to address um, Mr. Reardon's some comments? 
whatever you think best, you go right ahead. All right, I'll share screen. Um, with regard to the question of um, tabulating um, data over the year for the shadow, um, the solar exposure onto 43 Michael Street, we had done analysis. Um, so what you're seeing here is the existing condition. And in the graph over on the right, you'll see on the x-axis are the months and on the y-axis is monthly incident solar radiation. Um, yielding 1490 kilowatt hours per square meter years year. Um, and then with the proposed development, you'll see that number decrease to 1486, which represents uh, overall change of less than 0.003%. And there's a bit of a further breakdown if that helps over to the right. Um, just addressing around um, the months because the area of concern was the solstice. So we're looking from November to January um, and we're really not seeing, there's, there's really no effect on the other months. So that's um, the description of existing to new. We had a question on um, the Delta between the building that is being proposed and 27 Broadway with 27 Broadway, we'd like to note that the height is estimated based on observation. Um, what we're estimating approximately 18.8. Um, and then lastly, um, there was a question about the single egress from the second floor um, oh, let me show this again to you. The second floor roof deck, there's a single egress out to the community room. Um, we just wanna point out that during our presentation to town officials, we had not received any um, you know, contrary feedback to that proposal. And in reviewing the code, um, it's a compliant. We did on recommendation of the board reach out um, to ISD to get a confirmation, we're still awaiting um, a response. We haven't heard back yet, um, but we, we have initiated that discussion. Anything else, Rochelle? I think that will be it from UTL. I'm gonna invite Jeffrey to speak okay. about the site issues. Okay. Sure. Uh, Jeffrey Pilot, Sam Yotis consultants for the civil engineer on the project. Um, Sean covered the, the, the comments, the main, the main comments um, that we've been working with him um, over the past week or so. Um, we've done a site, uh, we've had a map from our team do a site observation on the sewer. Uh, appears that is a eight inch and not a six inch uh, main out in the street and it's flowing at about one third. Um, our calculations show that it's about 2% of the flow that's going in there, um, so we should be good on capacity. Um, the MEP provided the uh, the water and sewer calcs from the site. Um, let's see what other major items. The drainage system, uh, we've removed the infiltration system. Um, uh, changed that mini dry well to a solid cover, regraded that uh, those both those biking areas so there's no ponding issues, potential ponding issues in the within the garage. Um, and then, just like Mary said, you know we've gone through the bylaw, and uh, it due to the decrease in impervious area, it does not appear that we trigger the stormwater uh, permit. Uh, however, we've included the um, the waiver request uh, just in case if, uh, if the town engineer was requesting it, um, that's included with the package. Uh, there's photos and videos of uh, both that catch basin and the sewer manhole as part of the package. Um, the catch basin does show all three uh, connections uh, as uh, 
the two on the survey and then the one that wraps around the rear of the building. And the uh, the sewer shows that trough and uh, the the flow going through it on a weekend, uh, assuming that's a that's a good time to capture that. I think that captures everything uh, from the peer review letter. Anything else that Sean can think of, uh, willing to answer any questions at the moment? Mr. Chair, if I could ask a couple quick questions, Mr. Reardon. Um, so, so thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that work. Now, the one third vote, you, did, I didn't see all of the documentation you referenced yet. I looked through most of the stuff, but was what, what time of day was that? Do you recall? Uh, I'd have to ask uh, Matt. He's on the, he's on the call. Right. And then was there ever any visual evidence of surcharge in that structure at all? Not from the photos, no. Okay. And then the drain line that you referenced, you said, so um, you, you did find a third pipe in there heading um, up the, the, that side lot. Okay. Correct. We have the, uh, the 10 inch PVC that's heading towards our site that we're proposing to connect into. Yep. And then we have the 10 inch that wraps around the rear of the property, which, which appears to connect to an abutters garage, uh, which is a, the, another 10 inch. And then we have the, uh, the line that's leaving the system and then ultimately discharging to a bank out on Sunnyside Avenue. Yeah. Based okay. So that, that, that was, that, that addresses my biggest concern, which was, you know, is that, is that drain line that's extending onto your property serving anybody else? And based on what you just said, it, it, I, I doubt it is. So that's good. Thank you. Okay. Did uh, verify from the photo, uh, the timing, the timestamp on the photographs, but I believe I was there about uh, between four and 5 PM on Sunday when I, when I popped the two manhole covers off. Thank you. Mr. Oh, sir. That. Hey, Thanks, Matt. Sean, Sean, do you have anything else? Nope. Okay, so, Connor, are there, is there anything else that, that you want your team to cover? Not at this point. Great. Um, so, it's time for board comments. Is there anybody on the board who has uh, any questions or comments on what you've just heard? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont? So as I was looking through this uh, response uh, this afternoon, I noted that at least in one place, there was a reference to the layout of the parking spaces. And, and I believe um, Mr. Reardon had suggested spaces being redesigned. And I just wanted to understand a little bit better about what that entails and is that just something where you know there can just be some agreement later on down the line and those things are easily tended to or is that something that is a major concern now i know it wasn't raised um when mr reardon just went through his summary so but i just want to know are those um, references to parking spaces something that are sort of easily handled in a matter of course I think that's an accurate way to put it. And we actually suggested a, a, a means to doing so. And, and just to help understand that there's like two or three spaces in, in the garage that that lack sort of ideal access to them. So our, our solution or a suggested consideration is to just you know, mark those as, as, as compact spaces. So the shortcomings of the layout you know, are only really a problem for, for larger vehicles. If you designate them as compact spaces, I, I think they'd probably work just fine. There are other potential solutions. They could you know, redo striping or, or make a few changes, none of which is sort of um, going to reverberate through the development. Okay, thanks. That's what it sounded like. I just wanted to double check. Correct. So, Mr. Ridden, how, if we had to write a condition or or in some other way, make sure that this is paid attention to with building at the building permit stage. Uh, what would that, what would that condition say? I'm, I'm actually surprised I didn't recommend one. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, if, if you could just give me a minute to think about that. Okay, we'll come back to it. We'll come because back to I, it. I, th I think it's as simple as saying, <laughs> You could make them designate them as as compact spaces or otherwise redesign them. 
because there are there are opportunities whether it's with the layout of the handicap spaces or you know there there are and if they're if for example during the course of design their structure layout changes you know, we we would expect the garage layout to change a little bit um, during the course of design so um, I think I think as long as we um, specify <clears throat> how many spaces are required and maybe give them a little bit of leeway or otherwise direct them to use compact spaces for spaces that don't meet the standard dimensions of the, in the town um, we could we could address that so mr Ms. o'connor i'm not quite sure who would ask what what you've been thinking about that whether that's you teal jeffrey or whether rochelle uh, or who? i think that that's you teal um nick do you want to address that Sure. I, I mean, I don't think there's honestly much more to say beyond what what Sean has already articulated, which is that, you know, we'll continue to refine the parking plan. It's absolutely sort of part of, you know, part and parcel of uh, continuing to develop the design and we can easily make a compact space adjustment or we'll continue to be shifting columns around as we coordinate with our structural engineer, that sort of thing. So providing a little bit of a hammerhead at the end of the uh, drive aisle there to facilitate back out for those end spaces is really not an issue. but. Uh, I think we're probably flexible on, um, you know, language for a condition that would uh, make sure that that takes place. Okay. Mr. Trapond, anything else? Uh, no, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments on this? Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli. Uh, I'd just like to ask a question about the, um, the stormwater management system. So I understand, um, Sounds like it's not required to have the infiltration system, which is certainly a benefit um, for the project in terms of not having to install that. Um, but I just wanted to <clears throat> ask um, Mr. Reardon or um, the applicant, has there been any study done uh, to make sure that uh, without that infiltration system, the stormwater system can handle, you know, the hundred year or um, what we're obviously finding is that those hundred year floods happen more than every hundred years. So the, the capacity of uh, storms that we're, we're more used to seeing now? Yeah, I think the, the best way to address that is to say that the project's gonna result in a net reduction of runoff from the site. So, so, so regardless of what the outcomes are, regardless of what the analysis is, it, it's always gonna be less than what the, what the site currently sees. Um, another important factor is um, you know, the, the, the site is currently an at grade lot with an industrial use. Um, it's going to be switched to almost a completely covered roof. So from a water quality standpoint, the quality of runoff coming off this site is going to go up astronomically. So, so you're going to go from a, a relatively sort of sediment laden, potentially pollutant laden runoff to, to something that's, that's principally clean and basically doesn't even touch the ground. So, um, you know, just a, a, a a significant net benefit in both cases. And we've confirmed with our calculations that the, the system is not going to surcharge uh, above any of the rims on the 100 year storm, and that we have a, a we do have a, a reduced uh, peak flow for the, the 100 year in the post condition. And, and if I can add one other minor detail, so this is what's nice is we're right near a wife brook. So the run of storm drain is, is pretty short till it gets to an outfall. So it's only a few hundred feet and a couple sections of catch basin. So um, wouldn't expect there to be any sort of complication or collateral damage. Great, thank you so much. Anybody else? Mr. Chair? Mr. Klein. Um, first, I wanted to thank um, the applicant for the additional information on the solar studies and uh, for pursuing the, the egress question with inspectional service, but I do appreciate you looking into those matters. Um, I did have a couple questions on the waiver request. Um, so one of them is in regards to the size of the parking spaces, and it's a request to permit more than 20% of spaces to be sized for compact cars. And I'm wondering, is the applicant going to provide an upper bound for that, or is the request to leave that open-ended? Um. I think at this point to leave that open ended. So that potentially 100% of the spaces could be compact? Uh, no, we, we would not be doing that. I can say that. 
Uh, but at this point, I, I, I don't know, Nick, are you prepared to um, make a suggestion of the division between compact and regular size spaces? Not, not specifically. I mean, I think to maybe, you know, to speak to the point that we were just discussing a minute ago, you know, we have to have ongoing, uh, you know, design and coordination conversations with our engineers about structural layout, building layout, you know, accessibility clearances, all those types of things. And, you know, having a little bit of flexibility in the parking plan is one of the ways that we're going to be able to meet all of those uh, underlying requirements um, as the design progresses on a very tight site. So I feel like it might be a little bit premature for me to throw a number right out there. I agree with Mary. I don't think the plan is to do 100% convex spaces. We want to provide, you know, as functional a parking area as possible. Um, but I, I don't think I'm prepared to, to throw out a specific number uh, right off the, off the cuff. Because um, I have a similar question for the following one, which is <clears throat> about the, the drive aisle width and the reduction and the request is just for a reduction in the drive aisle size. And again, it doesn't have a bound. Um, I'm just a little leery about you know, issuing a comprehensive permit where those are, you know, very open questions as to to what the bounds of of those are. Um, if you could uh, make a proposal in two weeks at the meeting on the fifteenth, I think that would be helpful. I will. We'll uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Anything else? Um. <clears throat> so just anywhere else, uh, I. Just, Sort of like there's another one a modific uh, about parking lot setbacks, landscaping, and screening. Obviously, there were, the parking is all within the building, so I don't think that that's really a major issue. Um, and then the the fees and charges. I don't know. We haven't really discussed that question yet. Um, it, it, um, don't recall what the board had done specifically last time uh, we had done a project. Um, that had come to us from the housing corporation, um, so I, I, I think, I think we should, we should discuss that that question at some point, but does does not need to be now. Mr. Connor, can you find out what ha what happened in previous occasions where? Yeah, I can look at um, the one in uh, Downing Square and Broadway and see. So that would be that would be very helpful. Klein, mm -hmm. I'm all set. Um, is there anybody else who wishes to uh, has any questions, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dupont? So this is another question for Sean, and I think it's a probably a quick answer, but. Um, I know that in uh, number four, there was a uh, site prep and erosion control, and there was the question raised about um, when retaining walls were removed, uh, you know, next to uh, budding properties, and the, and the response was that there would be a detail in the construction management plan to address that. And I just wanted to know, because I'm not familiar with it, is that, again, something that's sort of technologically fairly standard to address, where if you're going to take something out that's, you know, holding back earth, that you have something that can easily be put in temporarily until the permanent, you know, structures for retaining are in place? Yeah, the, the easy is probably subject to interpretation, but there are methods. But in this case, and I, and I think the, the applicant addressed at the last hearing, is they anticipate having a conversation with each of their butters. Okay. Um, because, you know, frankly, there, there's, I don't see a way where they're, they're going to be able to remove those walls without, without at least, you know, a, a, a short term sort of occupation of, of the abutting parcel. Um, but I, I think the response that they gave that, you um, the solution has to be worked out in sort of coordination with the abutters and they plan to do so was exactly what I had hoped to hear. And, and I guess the follow up to that is that, and how does that get monitored then? Is that part of the construction management plan where, you know, reference will be made to the fact that conversations have been made, have been had and that um, agreements have been reached with regard to how that happens, I guess just seems like one of those details that's a little bit squishy at the moment. 
Yeah, I, I would think that it's it, it's something that the each of the landowners needs to work out independent of the board, that the okay. board doesn't even necessarily need to play a role in that. I mean, Paul can speak to that, but you know, typically we would we would leave that up to the the, the landowner to work out. Okay. And you know, the the more cooperation they get from their landowner, the easier the effort's gonna be. So you know, if they get no cooperation from the landowner, then they might have to drive piles or something like that. Um, the, the, the real distinction is, is there are solutions that can work for a very short period of time while they're constructing the new wall yep. that, that would suffice, um, but, but wouldn't, wouldn't suit a long-term application. So I, I think there are you know, a lot of ways to skin that cat. Um, certainly the easiest way would be to get some cooperation from the landowner, do some temporary grading, construct whatever wall system the building is proposing and then um, replace the grade. So I, I don't think this is going to be a, a sort of a heavy lift, but okay. um, it depends on the level of cooperation they can get. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Is there anything else? All right, well, as it happens, I had a whole bunch of thick questions to ask and my colleagues have asked all of them. And so I'm going to pass. Um, so it's time to um, open the public hearing. Um, appreciate the presentations from both Mr. Reardon and from the applicant. Uh, tonight's hearing uh, will be open to public comment. Uh, and I wanted to review some of the ground rules that I can recognize so many names here that you've all heard before. Um, but public questions and comment will only be taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Due to previously demonstrated interest in this project and to provide an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair strongly encourages individual public speakers to limit their comments and use their time provided to comment related solely <clears throat> to the topics that are discussed at this hearing. I will say that I'll be pretty tolerant about that because this is your last chance on a lot of issues. And uh, so it may very well be that uh, there are some things that have come up at other times that you wish to say something more about. Uh, we will remember and look review a transcript of what you said before, uh, but it's not going to be uh, quite as strict a, a focus on Mr. Reardon's report and the other things that we've discussed as we might otherwise do if we were having lots more meetings. Um, the chair will ask uh, members of the public who have previously identified themselves by logging in through Zoom, who wish to speak to digitally raise their hand using the raise hand button in the participants tab in the Zoom application. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You may unmute yourself. You'll be asked to give your name and address for the record, and you will be given up to five minutes for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Remember to speak clearly, concisely, and in a way that helps generate an act an accurate re record of the meeting. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate that you'd like to speak. And when you called on, you may unmute your line. Uh, please identify yourself by name and address for the record. And from there on, on follow the same rules I just said for people who are using their uh, computer. Once all questions and comments have been addressed or we've reached, uh, let's see, the hour, let's say of 9.15, um, the public comment period for this evening's uh, hearing will be closed. As noted previously, there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project, but not so many now, and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The next hearing will be focused a lot on the kinds of questions we've been hearing before about what would be in a condition. I should stress that the fact that we talk about that doesn't necessarily say that the board will adopt any of these conditions uh, or not make it up themselves when they get into the deliberation section, uh, nor does it necessarily mean that we'll grant the comprehensive permit. This is a way of working it all free and, and of, of whatever errors we can and trying to come up with the best conditioned uh, resolution of the, of the case that um, we can. Um, the, the board and applicant and staff will do our best to show the documents being discussed. And if you'd like a specific document to be displayed during your comment, please ask us to do so and we'll do our best to accommodate your request. Now that really means Ms. Ralston would do her best because my best would be totally unavailing, but she's really good at that. So with all that, uh, the public comment period is open. Is there anyone who wishes to address the application? Ms. Chaplin, welcome. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Monique Chaplin, 35 Michael Street. Uh, first, I just want to uh, thank uh, folks for doing the deeper dive of the shade study. That was very reassuring. Um, I'm primarily speaking to uh, just make sure that the zoning board and the housing corporation received the email sent by uh, the concerned abutters of Michael Street. We sent that yesterday and hard copy letters will be um, arriving via US Post in the next couple of days, outlining our concerns and uh, a few suggestions that we had that we hope you'll consider. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chaplin. Um, I actually haven't seen that yet, so I will be certainly on the lookout for it, and I'm sure that the applicant will be as well, and we can take up th those matters uh, when we get back together. Is there anybody else who wishes to address the application? Uh, Mr. Almond. No, well, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, if you wait, Mr. Ullman, you were sort of beaten out a little bit by um, uh, Mr. or Ms. Someone whose phone number ends in 644. So let me try calling on that person. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I've had to join you by phone tonight as opposed to video. Um, and my, my question uh, is just a... Um, a touch back to a question that I asked at a number of hearings ago, or maybe it was even the last one, about um, has there been any thoughts that the applicant has relative to uh, providing irrigation to the public street shade trees that are going to line the sidewalk uh, on sunny side there in front of the building? Oh, I can answer Mr. that. Uh, that we will not be doing that. There is no funds in this project to do that, to provide irrigation at all. And I'll add that, but we're, we're obviously committed to keeping all the trees alive. So we'll we'll find methods that, that work within our budget. So the stress is just on the irrigation part. Watering the trees is something that you're apt to do? If Yes. Well, our, our own irrigation on our property, I guess the street trees, maybe I've spoken out of line if that's our obligation or not. If the city, if the town would normally be supporting that. And the town actually regrets for all residential property owners, the town requests that the street trees, the ones that are in front of, that are on the right of way in front are watered at least and maintained that way by residents. It's a standard, a standard sort of thing. Is that true, Mr. Moore? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's a, that's exactly right. And for for a public street trees, the town provides what's called gator bags around the trunks of trees. That uh, it makes watering pretty simple in terms of just providing water into the bag once a week. So um, I'm hoping there'd be some commitment to that because I think the growth of trees in this area will greatly enhance the building. And and I know that they're adding a bunch of their own. Uh, plantings, which is great, but the street trees will uh, help, uh, I don't know, uh, modify, soften the transition between the building and the street on what amounts to is a pretty tight piece of property there in terms of the street width. So uh, I would uh, I would encourage that wa a watering uh, plant to be included in terms of the street trees. Um, I, I, I am pointing out, though, that when we make installs around town now, we are suggesting um, irrigation lines. Now, I understand that, as, as was clearly said, there's no funds in the budget for that, um, but helping of the watering would be, would be good. Um, my, se my second question is just kind of, a, kind of a point of information. It's not really a question. I, I joined this meeting late, and I apologize since you've already spoken to this. Um, uh, because I, when I came in, you were talking about um, the stormwater and mitigation plan and such, and some changes which have made, I believe, to deal with parking spaces under the building. Uh, could could the, the applicant quickly refresh my memory as to what's going to be done with the stormwater from the roof and such? Is it going to be put into a, in effect, a drywall sort of arrangement or something else? Jeff. Sure. Uh, it's going to be conveyed from the site. Uh, first, it's going to be pre-treated before it gets to a, uh, a drywall, and then it discharges to the abutting 
um, drainage system that's uh, the municipal system. The stormwater? Correct. It's uh, it's uh, roof water, so it's uh, considered clean. Uh, therefore, and also that we don't trigger the stormwater permit, uh, and we do have a reduction in pervious area uh, and a reduction in uh, peak overall peak flow, um, and therefore it's just going to uh, connect into the uh, municipal drainage system. Okay, and the drain, uh, Mr. Chair, the drainage system is designed. And I think Mr. Riccadelli asked this question already. Just it's designed to deal with the maximum flow of the 100 year storm and and for the 100 year storm and with the LY for close by was was NOAA the latest NOAA data used or the old uh the old storm totals it's based on a 24 hour storm event um i believe it's five right, seven but there, I, I know there's some newer storm data that is now being used for developments around town which developers are utilizing which basically is a higher Higher inflow. I'll you know what to, rain data was used for this project? Um, I'll have to check with my office, but um, I believe it's the latest. It's actually in the okay. in the initial in the initial submission uh, when they begins to discuss. It's the NOAA something or other, either plus or plus plus. I think the intention is yes. to is to meet was was to meet the uh, what is currently being requested of the Conservation Commission, even though they are not actually involved in this project. Um, but there was some question in my mind about whether it had enough pluses. So, uh, but if the <laughs> applicant can can look at that and just make sure uh, what it is, if 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 I, I can easily offline, I to look up and find out how many pluses there's supposed to be, I can look at the the last 40B that we did when this issue came up and I've conveniently forgot right. then just the way I'm forgetting now. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's helpful. We'll take a look. Thank you. So it, there was, Mr. Moore, his hand will come down in a second. Um, I'm trying to find the person who wished to speak before. Is there anyone on the line who wants to address this application? All right, seeing not, going once, going twice. The, the public hearing is closed. Um, these, is there anything further that anyone on the board wants to raise or anybody or the applicant, if there's something that has come up that causes you some concern. Mr. Hammond, I just wanted to answer Mr. Klein's question about the dry bio width, just to cross that off the list for next time. Um, as I understand it, the zoning requirement is for 24 feet. As drawn, we have a little bit less than 23 feet, and I think we would request a waiver for 22 feet at the minimum. And that aligns with um, other you know, municipal zoning codes in the greater Boston area for interior structured parking. We found that to be a functional uh, width in this application. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. All right. Mr. Chair, may I ask one follow-up question? Um, yes, Mr. Riccardelli. Just um, just um, speaking about the parking, um, and, and, you know, I think this is new, so I just wanted to ask, uh, but I, I think that recently there's been guidance uh, for electric parking charging stations to um, have accessibility requirements, um, which are ADA, not 521 CMR. So uh, just wondering if the applicant is planning to include those uh, with whatever charge spaces are being provided. Are, are you saying that you think that there are accessibility requirements in excess of what's called for in MAAB? That's right, yeah. So, okay. um, you know, previously we would provide accessible parking spaces and then electric charging spaces, and they wouldn't overlap because um, it would be restrictive. So if someone needed accessible an accessible space and also a charging station, they wouldn't have an option. So um, so we did, uh, I don't know if you recall, but we did submit an earlier plan at one of the previous hearings showing our in intended locations for the EV charging stations, some of which do serve those accessible spaces in the lower leg of the parking. So that's 
absolutely our intention to balance, you know, the number of EV charging spaces that we have with the number of accessible spaces that we have and make sure that there's, um, you know, equitable service being provided to everyone. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Was there anything else? All right, seeing none, I'd like to, before closing and all enjoying the rest of our evening, um, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, deliberation dates. Um, and these are not actually, these are not actually going to, this is sort of an, an administrative, actually, let's do this the other way around because the applicant doesn't, is not, going to be here for deliberation we can't they take any more uh input from the applicant and so uh the question about figuring out the right dates for it are not really matters that they and their team need to need to stand by and discuss it unless they they would like to because we're such charming people um so at this point the chair will entertain a motion to consider the hearing to uh continue this hearing uh, to a date certain of April, not April, August 15th, uh, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. So move, Mr. Chair. Is it moved by Mr. Klein. Is is it a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. To a roll call, Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. Okay, so this this case is continued until then. And I look forward to, to seeing you all again in what what I'm hoping is is our our uh, uh, our last last fling. Uh, and uh, so those of you who would like to stay on the line can, but I'm especially interested in, in holding on to Mr. Haverty and the members of the board. Um, the we have to be finished, as I said earlier, by the 24th. And uh, as a practical matter, we're not going to want to go up to, I mean, that's a Sunday. So that really means the 21st, which is a Thursday, uh, or maybe the 19th, which is the which which is a Tuesday. Um, the 12th we've reserved be, as one day for the uh, as one day uh, for the deliberation. Um, and I would like to propose to you, if you're able to do it, uh, meeting the day after Labor Day on the 5th. Uh, that puts us in a situation where I'm hoping that we can maybe can get done in one day, but, but especially in two. And if anything really comes up, it still gives us plenty of time to get our act together, have maybe as we did last time, uh, one hour, fixing up the whatever happens at the end where where it takes some extra time to do that whereas starting on the 12th and then going for the 19th or maybe going to a Thursday uh runs the risk that we have to scramble at the end which I I think we'd we'd like to avoid so I wanted to see if a schedule of the uh, meeting on the 5th with the thought that we carry over to the twelfth, if necessary, whether that uh, whether that is possible for you all, Mr. Haverty, let me. Ask I'm, I'm free both the fifth and the twelfth. Great, members of the board. Uh, those both work for me. Me too. Me as well. Thank you. Ms. Hoffman, uh, does that work for you? Yes. All right. So let's, Ms. Walston, if we can schedule those and do whatever we need to do to uh, uh, get the word out and onto the website and so forth, uh, that's that's where we'll go. Um, uh, Ms. Chaplin, the hearing's over, but but this is all a friendly gathering right now. So if you'd like to chat, please do. Thank you. I just had a quick question: whether these upcoming meetings are ones that the public are also invited to. Oh, yes. The public is always invited, but you'll be silent partners at the ones in se September. Uh, as I said earlier, we can't take any additional input from anybody. We can't even turn to the applicant on something and say, is that acceptable to you? Uh, we all It all has to be 
based on the hearings, what we've done so far and what we do on, on the 15th. But these are all public meetings, so, but they will be public meetings without public comment. Including the 15th? No, no, the 15th, I, I was just talking about the ones in September. The, the 15th is still, the hearing is going and that'll be treated in exactly the same way uh, that the meeting tonight and all the other ones that you've participated in. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, uh, I guess we're now at the point where if there's not, is there anything else that anyone wish, wishes to bring up before we do uh, an adjournment? So, Mr. Chairman, I, I think it would be helpful if I can get you a draft decision um, by the 8th, so we have it a week in advance yes. of the, the next hearing. Yes. That would so be that will be my goal. That that would be great. That would be great. And we'll all do our homework and make sure that that we're all loaded, not loaded for beer. That's not a good metaphor for, <laughs> for that particular thing. For the, the applicant may want to be loaded for beer, but <laughs> not us. All right. Is there anything else? If not, uh, Chair Leonard, chain a motion to adjourn. So move, Mr. Chair. Second. Mr. Moved by Mr. Klein. Seconded, I think, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Um, so we'll do the roll call. Uh, Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Mr. Holy? Mr. Mr. Holy is at least making motions that suggest an aye. Aye. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. yes now I can. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And we're all adjourned. Thank you very much for coming, and I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. And Mr. Ruth, in particular, thank you to you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.